السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الذي لا إله سواه والحمد لله حمدا يليق بجلال وجهه وبعظيم سلطانه والصلاة والسلام على نبيه الأمين وآله الطيبين وصحابته الغر الميامين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين اللهم اكتبنا منهم رب زدنا علما ولا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب When action is no action the imperative of ikhlas and ittiba I believe the title already uh, tells you and me what this is going to be about and it summarizes all what I'm going to be sharing with you here today in some details. In other words, at the end of this encounter with you, inshallah ta'ala, at the end of it, if you don't remember anything, then remember that action is no action unless there is ikhlas and ittiba. So this will be the principle that should guide you and me in our everyday life. And as yesterday we spoke about the moral challenge in pursuit of happiness as a result of the realization and thus the focus of and on the fact that we were created by Allah Azza wa Jal in order to fulfill ubudiyya to him. As a result of the realization of this ultimate purpose for which we were created, there is a sense of pursuit of happiness that results. And that happiness is attained by, uh, by undertaking that moral challenge that we spoke about yesterday. And when we win, if you will, or we successfully undertake, humbly said, that moral challenge, then indeed we are on the path of attaining happiness in this dunya and most of all in akhirah. But then also, since ubudiyah requires that we are undertaking a journey, as we called it yesterday, a journey back home. And home is in Jannah. The life of ours is a journey back home. That requires doing, that requires action, that requires deeds, that requires acts. And those acts and those actions are what will be our uh, our, our manifest external expression of this pursuit, of this journey back home. We have to do things. We have to work. We have to act. We have to externalize that uh, sense of ubudiyya that we have harbored inside of our hearts. And now, and now actions can be either good or bad, good or evil, wrong or right. What constitutes a good action? What constitutes an action, in other words, that is consistent with the purpose of fulfilling ubudiyya for which I was created? We can say first generally, that any act, any action that draws me away from this objective is an act that is not good, that is not even correct. Agreed? Since I have an objective, and this is the objective I want to attain, and if I commit actions or I do deeds that are not in conformity with that objective, then that action 
is not a useful action, is not a good action, it's even a harmful action. That's number one. <clears throat> Allah Azza wa Jal certainly in the Quran and Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam certainly in the Sunnah have indicated to us explicitly and in so many other ways as well that there are two conditions for any action to be an effective action or in a sense for an action to be accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for an action to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So since there are conditions for an action to be accepted by Allah azza wa jal, or to be rewarded by Allah azza wa jal, this automatically means that there are actions that are useless. There are actions that are in reality no action. In other words, I would have spent energy and that energy was spent in, was spent in vain and it will not bring fruits as Allah Azza wa dictated. So please keep that in mind. I mean by that, when we do what we do every day, at home, individually, in ibadat, and in mu'amalat. Mu'amalat meaning the, our interactions with other human beings in the world of the mundane. And ibadat meaning our interactions with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly through salah and sawm and dhikr and zakah and so on. Please note that those actions that we do every day could be completely useless. And therefore, it becomes imperative for every Muslim to know what constitutes an action that is acceptable and an action that bears fruits and an action that is an inaction. And thus, those two conditions that this deen teaches that every action I must subject it to a two pronged test. Number one, ikhlas. Number two, ittiba. Is this action that I am committing or not committing, does it fulfill the condition of ikhlas? And if it does, alhamdulillah, I do that and I continue to do that. If it does not, either I do not do it or I remedy and I rectify my state of qalb so that I have ikhlas. Then, then I perform that action. Number two, I'm going to look at the external nature and form of that action. While in the first condition, in the first test, I am looking at the state of my heart inside. What is it like? In the second case, for the second condition, I am looking at the external and the form state of my action. In other words, is that external action in accordance to the law? If we put it in, 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 in modern terms and in colloquial terms here, is it, is it in accordance to the law or is it not in accordance to the law? For example, you may be driving uh, in your neighborhood where it says uh, you cannot drive beyond 30 miles an hour and you drive 40 miles an hour. That's against the law, isn't it? And a police officer stops you. And then you say to the police officer, officer, I really meant no harm. I swear to God, I have genuine feelings. I was doing 40 miles an hour because I thought it was so good for me. I enjoyed the breeze. The, 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 you know, if I went an extra 10 miles an hour, there would be stronger breeze in, in the Florida area. And, and, and I feel cooler. I really meant no harm. 
And plus, I had to get home because my family is waiting for me. And I haven't seen them for three hours today. I really, it's, it's really genuine. I did not mean to, to be hurtful. What will the police officer respond? I'm sorry. It's against the law. You violated the law. You meant well. I appreciate it. I appreciate your feeling. Usually they are nice, some of them. So I would say, I appreciate it. I really appreciate your feelings, but I have to give you a ticket because you broke the law. Your action, though it was from a good heart, was not in accordance to the law. That's basically what it means when we speak about the condition of ittiba'. Ittiba' means my actions have to be in conformity with the law. And the law in this case is the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Now this is a, an outline, if you will. Let us now go through each of those two points in a little bit of details. The first one, al-ikhlas. Al-ikhlas is a state of your qalb, and we spoke about the qalb yesterday, and that's why uh, we had planned that speaking about the qalb is first, and it takes priority because everything comes from the qalb. Everything depends on the state of the qalb. So, since uh, we spoke of the uh, state of the qalb yesterday, I think today we will understand a little bit easier that ikhlas is a state of the qalb, of the inner state of your identity, if you will, of your person, not an external one. It's, if you will, um, quality of the qalb, not a quality of external limbs. Now, what does ikhlas mean? Well, in the Arabic language, ikhlas comes from the root of khalis, an adjective also khalis, uh, or khalusa, which means pure, which means not contaminated. Pure, not contaminated. So you may have, let's say, a piece of gold that is pure, a pure coin of gold. It's pure when it has no other impurities with it, when there is nothing but gold in it. And even if that gold is 27 karat and you put gold there that is 13 karat, that's not as pure. And therefore, we can imagine that when it comes to our, act our, I'm sorry, our actions, what motivates them from the qalb could be pure and could be impure, could be uncontaminated at all by anything, and it could be contaminated by something else. What is the contaminant of what's inside your qalb that motivates you and me to act? The contaminant in this case, in this deen, as it teaches us about our actions, is anything but that burst in your qalb for Allah Azza wa Jal, either out of fear or out of love and longing. I repeat, if inside your qalb the burst that precedes your action and mine that burst is all, is all not contaminated by anything except fear from Allah Azza wa or love and longing for Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ And for what Allah has. That's what I mean by love and longing for Allah Azza wa Jal. That's that burst. If it is contaminated by anything else, then it is not ikhlas. And the opposite of ikhlas is ishraq. The opposite of ikhlas 
is ishraq. So for example, if when I stand in salah, or when I come to the masjid for salah, I come to the masjid for salah, because I am a Muslim and I believe that Salah is mandatory and that there is reward for me with Allah Azza wa Jal and that it brings me nearer to Allah Azza wa Jal and that I do that also because I fear Allah Azza wa Jal for if I didn't I would be subjected to misery in this dunya and in akhirah and I do that because Allah Azza wa Jal deserves to be loved and to be served and to be bowed to and kneeled to and prostrated to. Allah Azza wa Jal deserves that because He is. If I, for example, perform my salah with this burst inside of my qalb, then inshaAllah ta'ala that is, I am in a state of ikhlas as salah is concerned as far as salah is concerned or that salah to which I went for them to the masjid for that particular time. But if, for example, there is something else inside my qalb, like, and I'm going to go there because I like to see, I like to see this person and I like to talk to that person. And I like, I like to listen to that person. I'm talking about two persons who meet, two friends who meet, and they just like to entertain each other. So it's a good time for me also to socialize. And it's a, a sports activity to go and walk to the masjid. And I'm using examples that are not extreme. There are something that is naturally halal. But that is a contaminant of my ikhlas. Because ikhlas means pure, nothing else. Nothing else with Allah Azza wa Jal. And with Allah Azza wa Jal, what do I mean? A burst inside of my qalb of fear or of love and longing for Allah and for what Allah has. If there is anything else, even something that is otherwise halal, that's not ikhlas. I fast, for example, Mondays and Thursdays, and I fast during the month of Ramadan because I am a Muslim, and because fasting the month of Ramadan is mandatory, and because fasting Mondays and Thursdays is highly recommended, and it is good. And I do that because I love Allah Azza wa Jal because I long for Allah Azza wa Jal, because I long for the rewards from Allah Azza wa Jal, because I want to be near to Allah Azza wa Jal, because I want to be accepted and loved by Allah Azza wa Jal. So I fast. I fast so that Allah Azza wa Jal cleanses my qalb, gives me strength of nafs in order to serve him more and to love him more, subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that's all, and that's ikhlas in my action. And the act of sawm is a full act. But if in addition to that, in addition to that, well, I fast also so that I can lose weight. I fast also so that I can lose weight. That's no more ikhlas. That's Ishraq. And the degree of severity of this Ishraq or this lack of Ikhlas depends on the degree of contamination in that Ikhlas of mine or in that action of mine. If, for example, that which motivates me originally is not Allah Azza wa Jal, the source of my action in this case of ibadah is not Allah Azza wa Jal. Now that's, that's the fullest extent of shirk. And that's shirkun jali. That's an obvious, explicit uh, shirk. Unambiguous, clear. 
But if what motivates me originally is Allah Azza wa Jal, but somewhere, somehow, in the middle or at the end, and so on, there is another force or another uh, motivation that is added to that. Even if that motivation is halal, but is not consistent with ikhlas itself, with the purity of that burst from the qalb, then that is not full ikhlas. That is not full ikhlas. What can motivate the individual sometimes are many things. Certain things could be uh, my attachment to dunya. My, I like and I enjoy uh, leadership and authority. Why do I, for example, perform da'wah? Why do I teach in masajid? Why do I teach in schools this deen and about Allah Azza wa Jal? Why do I want to be uh, the president or the imam or cover of this or that institution or the khalifa of this country? Why? There is either ikhlas or lack of ikhlas. If what motivates me to join a halqa, to learn and to teach, is not that burst and that burst only of fear and of love from Allah, for Allah Azza wa Jal, then I am not in a state of ikhlas. Some of us are motivated, for example, in the field of da'wah, oh, because it it, it exposes me to people. I begin to build a reputation and people get to know me and I get to lead and I want to lead rather than be led. Human beings are plagued with the illnesses and the ailments of the nafs that we spoke about yesterday. Subhanallah. One of the early Salaf rahimahumullah ta'ala had said, Akhiru ma yakhruju min ru'us as-siddiqeen hubbul ri'asa. Subhanallah. If a... <laughs> Let me translate first. He said, the last thing that shall ever leave the head of a siddiq, not just a person who is less than a siddiq, a salih or or just an, a regular person like me, but a Siddiq. He said, the last thing that shall ever leave the head of a Siddiq is to love to be the head. The love to be the head. And that love to be the head oftentimes motivates good actions motivates a person's coming to the masjid, a person's involvement in da'wah, a person's involvement in ilm, in learning and in teaching, a person involved in conducting halqat and being in halqat, a, person's, uh, uh, a person involved in joining a jama'ah. That could be what originally motivates the person. And that's the worst type of lack of ikhlas, if I want to put it mildly. But if the original again burst was Allah Azza wa Jal, and then it is contaminated by something else of these types and others that I mentioned, then that is an ishraq, if you will, partial ishraq. And it is partial ikhlas. Now, will partial ikhlas be accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal or not? The ulama have two views, rahimahumullah ta'ala, on this matter. Some ulama have said that as long as there is any ishraq in any action, none of that action is accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. None of that action is accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ 
says Allah Azza wa Ala lillahi dinul khalis, says Allah Azza wa They say none of that action is accepted. The other opinion says if the degree of ikhlas and the degree of ishraq, of contamination, are equal, they said, then the person's action is neither rewarded nor punished. But if the degree of ishraq overrides the degree or the level of ikhlas, then that person is punished. The action results in no action and the result with Allah Azza wa is punishment in Akhirah and maybe even in dunya, in this life. And there are so many ways Allah pun punishes human beings in this dunya. And then of course, the third uh, possibility is when ikhlas and the contaminating ishraq are such that ikhlas level dominates or overrides the ishraq level and when we speak of ishraq in the sense that I mentioned through those examples then they say like Imam al-Ghazali and others rahimahumullah ta'ala that the reward the, uh, the, the action inshallah will be rewarded but to a lesser extent than the reward of the action that is fully for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Now, as I said, there is a shirk that is jali. A shirk that is jali, and namely, obvious, direct, clear. And that is when the motivation again, the burst inside of my qalb, before the initiation of the action, is other than Allah Azza wa Jal. That is jali. Shirkun Jali. And we're talking again about here within the context of Islam. Within the context of being a Muslim. We're not speaking of a mushrik, a person who rejects Allah Azza wa and associates partners with Allah Azza wa That is not our talk here today. Our talk here is within Islam. A person is a Muslim. But the action of a Muslim is characterized sometimes by either absence of ikhlas totally or partially. And for that, we have to be very careful. Now, that is a shirk al-jali, or al-ishraq al-jali, is when, again I repeat, the original or the initiating burst inside of my qalb is other than Allah Azza wa Number two, a shirk al-khafi. The less obvious shirk, or the tacit one, or the hidden shirk, if you will. What is this other hidden shirk that contaminates our actions and therefore would render our action as no action, totally or partially? And that Rasulullah calls. He defines it and he says that is Ariya. Ariya. Ariya from Ra'a originally, but Ra'a, Yura'i, Riya'an. That is when a person, he or she does something and does it and desires to be seen. and desires to be seen by others. That Rasulullah calls shirk, and he calls it shirkun khafi, the hidden shirk, because it is not as obvious as the first one when originating inside your heart, the burst of action is other than Allah Azza wa This riya is there is that burst, that original burst for Allah Azza wa this khafi type of shirk, 
but it is contaminated by this desire somehow to be seen by others. And to be seen by others can be manifested in so many ways. You know, every adult and maturing adult knows. And especially if you somehow have undertaken the path of struggle against your nafs, then you discover every day the extent of those hidden feelings and those hidden motives inside of you and me. So, here are some states or levels of riya that every and each Muslim on the path of ubudiyah must be conscious of. Every Muslim, as we mentioned yesterday, who is undertaking the moral challenge in pursuit of happiness must know and must watch for and against. Sometimes a person does a good act, a good act externally in accordance to the law, in accordance to shara. But there is something inside The person, for example, goes to ibadah and likes to be seen in ibadah, likes to be seen in salah. He, he or she inside, inside, and he or she knows, and Allah before that, others may not know. Most people don't know what people have inside. We don't know what people have inside. This is for you and me to assess yourself and myself, not to assess others. This is not intended for you and me to take it and then project it onto others. Oh, I know now what she's doing. I know now what he's not doing. If that's what you use this ilm for, then that is dangerous use of ilm. And then we have not gotten the point. This means for me, and you to gauge and assess ourselves. So, I like, if I like someone to see me in ibadah or in, a, in the performance of a good action, like in teaching or in learning or in da'wah or in, in, in an act of, of, of a charitable doing, Motivate my, my original motivation is Allah. But once someone sees me, uh, it, gives me, it gives me more energy to do more of what I was doing. Subhanallah. If someone does not see me, if I'm not seen, I'm not exposed in this, during this action, I am doing it still. My motivation still is Allah Azza wa Jal. But when others see me, then somehow I get more energy. That's a hidden aspect of Riyah. Subhanallah. Which is less serious than the previous one, of course. But it is Riyah. And to the extent of the existence of that Riyah inside my Qalb, there will be less reward from Allah Azza wa Jal, if not punishment. There is a more hidden level of that riya. I am performing this action of salah or of sawm or of sadaqah or of dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal, or of da'wah to Allah Azza wa Jal, or of imparting ilm to others or in learning ilm and so on. And when people see me, whether they see me or they don't, my level of energy, alhamdulillah, is the same, is positive and the same. It does not re-energize me or over-energize me. But I feel I like it. I just feel, I feel a sense of rejoice. I feel good when I am aware that someone is looking at me. 
Subhanallah. That's a more hidden level of riya. And that is riya. As a matter of fact, I may even go and perform, let's say if it comes to ibadah, I perform my ibadah and I insist that I do my best that no one sees me. And if they saw me, it does not energize me. But something inside is tickled. And I feel good and happy. Because they saw me. And if I, they didn't see me, I don't feel that delight and that pleasure and that rejoicing. Whether in salah or saum or dhikr or sadaqah or da'wah or teaching or learning, anything that has to do with Allah Azza wa Jalla. Do you think there is something more hidden than this? Yes, say our ulama, rahimahumullah ta'ala, those whom Allah Azza wa Jal gave ilm of the batin, the ilm of the fiqh of the heart, of the qalb, and how to understand the qalb and know the qalb and polish the qalb, taken from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and how the sahaba lived, radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa ardahum, and those who have been given also the ilm of the external fiqh as well, the fiqh of al-jawarih, if you will, they have, with the ilm that Allah gave to them and the, alhamdulillah, the purity of heart that Allah Azzawajal bestowed upon them, they were able to see and express these things in such eloquent ways, in such eloquent means and simple ways also, rahimahumullah ta'ala. So they speak of another fourth level that is even more hidden. In this case, I would perform the action. My original motivation is Allah Azza wa Whether a cow sees me, or another human being sees me, or millions of good human beings see me, it doesn't matter. It doesn't produce any difference, neither in energizing me to do, nor in what I feel inside of my heart of relaxation and of comfort and of peace, but something happens outside of the realm of my action. For outside of the realm of my action, when the action is done and I'm somewhere else, and someone sees me and knows me, inside of me, says Imam al-Ghazali and others before him and after him, rahimahumullah ta'ala, I like him or her to show me an extra sense of respect. I'm not saying by this that people should disrespect other people or their ulama. No, you should always show respect and reverence to your ulama and to your teachers and to your fathers and mothers and, and colleagues. But uh, what I mean by that is what is in his or her heart what is in my heart? Do I expect someone to show me something extra? And if he or she doesn't, I feel that he or she has not given me my due right. And I feel something inside, something that either to the extent that inside of me I am angry at that person, or inside of me I feel discomforted. That's riya'un akhfa. Subhanallah. And thus, the presence of any of these contaminants depending on their intensity, as you see, renders my action as either no action or highly diluted action, or partially diluted action. One of the old Salaf, عنهم, 
those whom Allah gave ilm and ma'rifah. He was, he, was, uh, he was asked to lead them in salah. He was offered to lead them in salah. Not the official imam. The official imam he has to lead salah. Does lead salah. But he was offered to uh, lead them in salah. And they insisted. He said, no way. I will not. Again, out of fear for any iota of lack of ikhlas inside of his or her heart. Let alone competing in terms of who leads. And designing and planning and plotting. Or designing and planning and plotting as to who is president of this institution. I seek by this only to advise myself first and then my all brothers and sisters. For I truly, I truly, I truly do not want my actions to be no action. And I do not want to continue to see the actions, as was said earlier by Sheikh al-Masri, that the actions of this ummah continue to be no action. So we must watch this qalb. So he refused. He wouldn't lead Salah. And then ultimately they insisted and he uh, went forward to lead Salah and he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, all right, if I lead you in this Salah by Allah, I will not lead you in the next one or in any one after that. And then the other one replied, look at this, this group of people. The other one replied, Wayhak, woe on you. Are you expecting to live until the next salah? Wayhak. Ata'amal wa anta'isha ila salat al-asr? Are you expecting to live until the next salah, salat al-asr? In other words, ma atwala amalak. Oh, your, your aspirations, your hopes of living are very far stretched. You plan too far ahead. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Ikhlas is the essential ingredient, the essential quality of the qalb from which there comes that burst called the niya. That's the niya now. From which comes that burst that we call the niya for the action to be an action. To be a action. And to be rewarded and accepted by Allah Azza wa And to contribute therefore to my pursuit of happiness in this dunya and in akhirah insha'Allah ta'ala. And therefore to continue safely my journey back home of Ubudiyah, back to Allah Azza wa Jal. There is a lot we can say about this condition of ikhlas and about the, 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 the rendering of the absence of ikhlas of the action to uh, the rendering it uh, no action. But this, insha'Allah, of ikhlas will suffice and I go to the next condition. Namely, the condition of al-ittiba. And as I pointed out earlier, the condition of ikhlas is a condition of the qalb and the condition of ittiba is the condition of the external jawarih, that is, to do things in conformity with the law, in conformity with the shara'ah. Allah Azza wa Jal ordered and commanded Subhanahu wa Ta'ala and so did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam commanded that all of our actions are to be in conformity to his teachings i.e. his sunnah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ 
Allah says, commands, and, and in a gentle way says to us, tell them, Ya Muhammad. This is the meaning of the text. Tell them, Ya Muhammad, tell the believers that if you truly have hub for Allah Azza wa Jal, if you truly have hub for Allah Azza wa Jal, then ittabi'uni. Let your conduct be in accordance to ittiba' of my way. I don't like to translate it simply as follow me, though literally that's what it says. But follow me means live by my way. And my way means in principles and in details, in manhaj and in juz'iyat, in the methodology of understanding the questions of life, and also when it comes to the specifics of the questions of life. This is my way. وَأَنَّ هَذَا صِرَاطِي مُسْتَقِيمًا فَاتَّبِعُوهُ وَلَا تَتَّبِعُوا السُّبُلَ فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ Says Allah Azza wa Jal. This is my tariq, my way, my path, and it is straight. Stay on it. Stay on it. Do not be tempted to try something else. Do not be tempted to try something else. For if you do, فَتَفَرَّقَ بِكُمْ عَنْ سَبِيلِهِ It will disperse you and scatter you away from that path designed for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The opposite of ittiba' the opposite of ittiba' is called in our shar'i language al-ibtida' and it rhymes. If it is not ittiba', it is ibtida'. If it is not ittiba', it is ibtida'. وَرَهْبَانِيَةً ibtada'uha مَا كَتَبْنَاهَا عَلَيْهِمْ Says Allah Azza wa Jal. This is perhaps the only place in the Quran where this term is used to mean exactly the opposite of ittiba'. Al-Rahbaniya monasticism that the early Christians after Isa alayhi salam they innovated and they invented says Allah Azza wa Ibtada'uha because Ibtada'a literally means to innovate and to invent and to bring something new that was not before and we're talking about in, in, this, in this context we're talking about these uh, innovations or these inventions, if you will, within the context of deen, not within the context of other than deen. I mean by that, uh, I'm not talking about inventing a car or inventing uh, an airplane and so on. That's another discourse. Why is it not called ibtida? That's another discourse. Yet, there is nothing that escapes the realm of deen as we understand deen in Islam because deen encompasses every aspect of life. Why inventing a car is not an ibtida in the deen? That's because the definition of ibtida does not allow for that to be to fall under the category of ibtida. And that's another discourse. Now, an action becomes a no action. For example, you all know and agree that if my action is an action of ma'asiyah, if I disobey Allah Azza wa Jal, for example, Allah Azza wa Jal says, do not watch at haram things. And I use my eyes to watch at haram things. And I know it is haram. That's an act of ma'asiyah. That's an act of disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. If Allah Azza wa Jal orders me to perform salah on time and I delay salah unnecessarily, that's a ma'asiyah. That's a disobedience of Allah Azza wa Jal. That is not a bid'ah. That is not an ibtida'ah. Because I know what I should do. And I know that salah on time is 
very important. And I know that uh, the example I, I gave earlier to that, I know that, uh, that it is haram to, uh, let's say, for example, to backbite. And I continue to backbite. I know what I'm doing is wrong. That's a masiyah. But a bid'ah, an ibtida, is I think it is right. I argue it is right. I argue it is right. And I desire by my action to be closer to Allah Azza wa Jal. My intent behind the action that is an ibtida is to be nearer to Allah Azza wa Jal. In other words, my niyyah is very good. My niyyah is very good. And I argue and I build arguments to sustain it and to justify it. That becomes a bid'ah when it is wrong. And I shall a moment later give you the definition of bid'ah in words as our ulama rahimahumullah ta'ala of old have defined it. But ibtida' is very, very, very serious because it renders action no action. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, said, for instance, uh, in, in the famous uh, opening of, his, of many of his, of his uh, speeches, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, many, not all of his speeches, وَأَنَّ خَيْرَ الْهَدِيِ هَدْيُ مُحَمَّدٍ صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم وَشَرَّ الْأُمُورِ مُحْدَثَاتُهَا وَكُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ وكل بدعة ضلالة وفي رواية وكل ضلالة في النار سبحان الله He first begins by saying صلى الله عليه وسلم The best of ways, the best of guidance, the best of minhaj The best of methodology The best of way is the way of Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم And that is in principles and in details and then the worst of matters, then he's speaking about the, in contradistinction to following the hadi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he speaks about this one. وَأَنَّ كُلَّ مُحْدَثَةٍ بِدْعَةٍ And therefore everything invented in this way of Muhammad, added to it or subtracted from it, أُحْدِثَ يَعْنِ لَمْ يَكُنْ مِنْ قَبْلُ ثُمَّ أُحْدِثَ مِنْ بَعْدُ Something that was not before within his minhaj, within his hadi, and then it came after that, either added or subtracted. That's what he's therefore saying. وَأَنَّ كُلَّ Every, without exception, muhdatha is called a bid'ah. And he, without exception, says every bid'ah is a dalala. Dalala means when one is lost. You don't call a person who commits a ma'siyah a dal, by the way. A person who commits a disobedience of Allah Azza wa knowing that it is a disobedience out of weakness uh, or out of jahl and wishes that he or she didn't do that and sometimes cries to Allah Azza wa and asks Allah for forgiveness, that's ma'siyah. Allah never calls ma'siyah dalala. But call, subhanallah, bid'ah, dalala, even though bid'ah, one does it wanting to be nearer to Allah Azza wa Yet he calls it dalala, and dalala is worse than ma'asiyah. You're lost. وَأَنَّ كُلَّ بِدْعَةٍ ضَلَالَةٍ And then every such dalala ends up, says he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in the fire of hell. And he also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Man ahdatha fi amrina hadha ma laysa minhu fahuwa rad. Anyone who ahdatha, again ahdatha, introduces something that was not within the already existing hadi of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, either again in details or in principle, then 
This matter that has been introduced in this deen of ours, فَلَيْسَ مِنْهِ is not of it. مَنْ أَحْدَثَ فِي أَمْرِنَ هَذَا مَا لَيْسَ مِنْهِ I'm sorry. That which is not of it, فَهُوَ رَدْدْ then it will be rejected back against him or her. And that is action becomes no action. And he also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, authentically, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمَلًا لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُنَا فَهُوَ رَدْ The first case tells us about, the first case tells us about introducing a concept that is a bid'ah. Someone would say, but I have not invented anything. I am simply doing what I saw others do. Then this text says, من عمل. Then this text includes this second individual. Because it says, he who or she who does anything that is not of our hadith, then it is rejected against that person and not accepted by Allah Azza wa Jal. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi also said in, in a part of a hadith, uh, well-known hadith, authentic, وَمَنْ يَعِشْ مِنْكُمْ بَعْدِي فَسَيَرَ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِسُنَّتِي وَسُنَّةِ الْخُلَفَاءِ الرَّاشِدِينَ الْمَهْدِيِّينَ تمسكوا بها وعضوا عليها بالنواجذ وإياكم ومحدثات الأمور فإن كل محدثة بدعة وأن كل بدعة ضلالة says he صلى الله عليه وسلم what means those of you who live after me will witness many divisions and will witness differences in this ummah. Because people opine and they have views and they extend certain things and they uh, uh, make conclusions. There is ishtihad, there is genuine ishtihad, there is lack of genuine ishtihad. And all of those reasons are there. There is hawa. Follow ones, opinions and views independently from shara, independently from a shari methodology. You may have somebody who says, let us stick to shara. Let us stick to the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But his or her methodology violates that very call that he or she is making. And that his or, his, his or her methodology is not consistent with the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because then he says, sallallahu alayhi wa when you witness that, what to do? Alaykum bi sunnati. Hold on fast to my sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided khulafa after me. That is, those who live in accordance to his sunnah, sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And those who were his direct students, bright students of the greatest teacher of all time. Can you imagine what students are formed? Just imagine one of you uh, living with the greatest teacher on earth now of, of ilm and you are a bright with high IQ student and a clean heart and you stick around that alim for 10 years, for 13 years, for 4 years, for 5 years. Can you imagine what you're going to become? An expert in the knowledge of that master. So that is what those early sahaba were and thus says he sallallahu alayhi wasallam hold on fast to their sunnah and then beware of newly invented matters in this deen things that did not exist in his time sallallahu alayhi wasallam and in the time of his sahaba in principle or in details Iyakum, stay away from them. Beware. وَإِيَّاكُمْ مُحْدَثَاتِ الْأُمُورِ For every such muhdatha is bid'a and every such bid'a is dalala and I have already translated what these mean. The Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa ardahum followed suit 
And here we hear Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa ardah saying, اِتَّبِعُوا آثَارَنَا وَلَا تَبْتَدِعُوا فَقَدْ كُفِيتُمْ Says here, rahimahullah ta'ala, follow our path, the path of the companion, says he, sallallahu radiallahu ta'ala an. And do not invent things, do not think you're going to bring something better than what already exists, than what we already communicated to you and, and taught you through what the master teacher taught us in principles and in details. فَقَدْ كُفِيتُمْ For this knowledge that we are imparting to you, is sufficient. Don't go look for something else beyond or in addition. He uh, also said, رضي الله تعالى عنه وارضاه, القصد في السنة خير من الاجتهاد في البدعة. القصد في السنة خير من الاجتهاد في البدعة وهذا معنى ما قال الحسن البصري رحمه الله تعالى عمل قليل في سنة خير من عمل كثير في بدعة That is to act uh, to perform small acts within the sunnah is better than to perform many more acts and struggle more to perform more acts outside of sunnah within a bid'ah Abu Muslim, Abu, Abu, Abu Idris al-Khawlani, rahmahullah ta'ala, said of the Tabi'i period, La an ara naran fil masjidi, fil masjidi, la astati'u itfa'aha, ahabbu ilayya min an ara bid'atan, la astati'u taghiraha. Says he, rahmahullah ta'ala, which means, it is more beloved to me to see a fire in a masjid, physical fire in a masjid, and I am unable to extinguish it, than to see a bid'ah in a masjid, and I am unable to change it. Al-Fudayl ibn Iyaz, rahimahullah ta'ala, says, Ittabi' turuq al-huda, wa la yadurruka qillatu al-salikin, wa iyaka wa turuq al-dalalah, wa la taghtarra, he says, hold on fast to the path of Huda, to the path of, of the Huda of Rasulullah sallallahu And you shall not be hurt and do not be concerned with the multitude of followers. I'm sorry, with the, I'm sorry. And do not be concerned with the scarcity of those who follow on this path. And, and beware from the path of Dalala other than the way of Muhammad وسلم, and do not be deceived by the multitude of those who are destroyed. He called them not followers but those who have destroyed themselves even if there are too many. Again, emphasizing this concept of ittiba. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud coming back to him says, لا يأتي عام إلا والذي بعده شر منه لا أقول عام أمطر من عام ولا أقول عام أخصب من عام ولا أقول إمام خير من إمام ولكن ذهاب علمائكم وخياركم ثم يحدث قوم يقيسون الأمور بآرائهم فيهدم الإسلام ويثلم he says, every year that shall come will be worse than the one that preceded it. And he said, I don't mean by that one year there is more rain and the next year there is less rain. And I don't mean by that that one year will be more fruitful at the level of produce and a year will be less fruitful the next year. I don't mean by that a leader this year is worse than the leader last year. I mean by that the going away the disappearance of your ulama, the good ulama who were on the path of Rasulullah 
and the khiyar and those who were good and the best amongst them. And then thereafter, they shall be replaced by people who will take ilm and they will use independently from shara. That's what he means, their views and their opinions. Independently from shara and independently from a minhaj, a methodology of shara within shara, within the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi And then they will use their minds independently from shara and this deen will be leveled down to the ground. Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, one day sees, he sees a person in Hajj at Ihram. And when he wanted to be in a state of Ihram, that person said to Al-Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala, Ya Aba Abdullah, I have decided to begin my Ihram from the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says to him, Al-Imam Malik, La taf'al, don't do that. The ihram for people of Medina starts from a place about 12 miles or so south of Medina called Dhul Hulayfa. And that is where Rasulullah began his ihram. He said, don't do that. Begin where Rasulullah began. He says, what's wrong with that? I only mean to add extra miles and more barakah to start from the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu He says, لا تفعل إني أخاف عليك الفتنة He says, don't do. I fear for you fitna. And what does fitna mean? Fitna in this sense mean you will be tribulated in your mind and heart. And you will lose focus and you will go on a path where you do wrong and you think you're doing right. This is the fitna he meant, radiallahu ta'ala anhu ardah. He says, don't do inni akhafu alayk al-fitna. Qala wa ayyu fitnatin hathihi wa min ya shaykh, in other words, you're exaggerating. Hold on, hold on. What fitna is this? I mean, just be, I'm just intending to begin at the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these are only extra miles and more barakah. He says, Iqra' qawlahu ta'ala. Look at the, at the uh, subhanAllah, the fiqh of Imam Malik and the a'imma of that caliber, rahimahumullah ta'ala jami'an. He says to him, Allah Azza wa Jalla says in the Quran, فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ أَنْ تُصِيبَهُمْ فِتْنَةً أَوْ يُصِيبَهُمْ عَذَابٌ أَلِيمٌ فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ The other key word is عَنْ He didn't say only فَلْيَحْذَرِ الَّذِينَ يُخَالِفُونَ أَمْرَهُ بَلْ قَالَ عَزَّ وَجَلْ عَنْ أَمْرِهِ And this means those who deviate away from his way, not only those who disobey his command directly, عَنْ أَمْرِهِ Let them beware that they would be, uh, uh, that they would be befallen, that they would be subjected to a fitna and to a severe punishment from Allah Azza wa This is the ayah that Imam Malik used to tell this person who, unlike a person who is in intiba', he wanted to do something which we call ibtida'. He thought this is good. There is, what's wrong with this? And I'm going to add more ibadah. I'm going to even walk more. And I'm going to be in a longer state of ihram. But Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did not do that. Didn't Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa know whether starting ihram from al-Masjid al-Nabawi, didn't he know if it were better that it would be better than starting from the Hulayfa? Or did he not know? If we say he didn't know, we mean that Allah didn't know because he receives his ilm from whom? From Allah Azza wa Jal. Now, did Allah Azza wa Jal forget that there is good in this? Anyone who says, probably, well, that's a kafir. So we're not talking to those. You must say Allah knew. Now, if Allah Azza wa Jalla knew, 
why didn't he legislate starting ihram from al-masjid al-nabawi for a reason or for no reason if one says for no reason then that is kufr wal billah if one admits and one must admit if one is a sincere seeker of knowledge that it is for a reason now the next question is the reason for me to do otherwise better than the reason that Allah has if I say yes that is kufr QED QED that's the proof because every time we introduce such a thing in this way we are as if though we don't say it with our tongues as if we are um, assuming or believing that we are discovering something that Allah didn't know or his Rasul did not know sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is called al-istidraq ala sharra lisanu al-hali istidraq ala sharra wal billah وَلَا يَقُولُ بِهَذَا عَاقِلْ نَاهِيكَ أَنْ يَقُولَ بِهِ عَالِمْ فَإِنْ قَالَ الْعَالِمُ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ فَالْعَالِمُ يُخْطِئُ وَيُصِيبُ وَمِنْ سِيمَةِ الْعُلَمَاءِ وَمِنْ شِيمَةِ الْعُلَمَاءِ أَنَّهُمْ إِذَا عَلِمُوا الْحَقَّ فِي غَيْرِ مَا ظَنُّوا إِبْتِدَاءً رَجَعُوا إِلَى الْأَمْرِ كَمَا يَنْبَغِي أَنْ يَكُونَ رحمه الله تعالى جميعا الاستدراك على الشرع is to assume that I discovered something that Allah didn't know if I have accepted these arguments mentioned before in particular when the reason that led me or that would lead me later to say this is good to do, this is good action to bring me nearer to Allah Azza wa The reason that generated that in me now, that same reason existed in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi or his Sahaba. If that same reason existed, then definitely my action to do what was not done when the reason for it existed is bid'ah. Because otherwise, well, billah, I'm going to accept the premise that Allah didn't know. Or that Allah Azza wa does reasons, does things for no reason without hikmah. But if the reasons, there are reasons later that did not exist in that time, then that's where ijtihad comes in. And therefore, the bid'ah is defined as, as the ulama of old have defined it, rahmahullah ta'ala, al-bid'atu tariqatun fi dini muhdathatun tudahi al-shar'iyata yuqsadu bis-suluki alayha al-mubalagatu fi ta'abbudi lillahi subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-bid'atu Tariqatun fi dini muhdathatun. It's a way in deen, not in dunya. That's why cars don't come in. Tariqatun fi dini, in deen muhdatha. It came anew when it was not before. Tudahi ash-shar'iyata. Tudahi ash-shar'iyata. In other words, it takes place instead of the way that is shar'i or it competes with the way that is shar'i or it comes in parallel to the way that is shar'i tudahi ash-shar'iyata next point of the definition all of these must be and one and two and three and four yuqsadu bis-suluki alayha ما يقصد بالسلوك عليها المبالغة في التعبد لله سبحانه وتعالى. The intent behind taking this way is to emphasize عبادة for Allah عز وجل. 
In another definition of some other ulama, yuqsadu bi suluki alayha ma yuqsadu bi shar'iyati, and this even is more serious in what it includes of bid'ah and not, and we don't have time to go through those details. The people of ilm, those who are able to read some usuli discourse, there is a great work, no work was written before it like it, nor after it like it as the ulama of the caliber of the writer had said rahimahumullah ta'ala namely kitab al-i'tisam lil imam al-shatibi rahimahullah ta'ala of the maliki madhab al-imam al-shatibi rahimahullah ta'ala kitab al-i'tisam no serious student of ilm and of this sharia must remain without having read and studied and absorbed that work And therefore, any, any action that falls under the definition of bid'ah is no action. Who says so? Allah says so. Rasulullah says so. Some of us sometimes, some people say, as long as we have good hearts, that's what counts. This is bid'ah. Please, I don't use this term. I'm afraid of this term. Ya'lamullah ta'ala. Because sometimes I believe it is abused by some people and not properly uh, adhered to. Because every time you say this is a bid'ah, you're saying the action of yours will take you to Jahannam. So you're telling the person you're going to Jahannam. So be careful. It's to say we should not speak about bid'ah is another bid'ah. Because Rasulullah spoke about bid'ah and taught about bid'ah and warned about bid'ah. And his companions did radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa ardahum. To say that ikhlas only counts is a bid'ah. Why? Because neither Rasulullah وسلم, nor the companions, nor the tabi'een, nor tabi'i tabi'een, not any alim worth the name, ijma'an bayna ahli al-ilm ever said, ever said that what counts only is ikhlas or what's in the heart. Some Christians may say that. And they do, I know that. Some people who shop for religions, which one is easier, which one is more fun, which one is more entertaining, which one satisfies my nafs, my behemi nafs, or my predatory nafs, or my shaitani nafs. Remember yesterday? And we shop for which way and which religion and which madhab satisfies more of these. And that's what I take. To say that only what's in my heart counts, that's another bid'ah. And that's a very dangerous bid'ah. That would be bid'atun kulliyya, li'annahu yatarattabu alayha bid'atun juz'iyatun ukhra. That's a bid'ah that is, uh, that is, uh, that underneath it come many sub bid'ah because it is a matter of principle, it's a violation of a principle. And therefore we learn from this, yes, that there are bid'ah that are kulliya and bid'ah that are juz'iyya. Bid'ah kulliya, for example, the example I gave you, that ikhlas is all what that counts. And it is kulli because you may have thousands of issues that come as a consequence of this concept. Another bid'ah, kulliya, is secular humanism. And secular humanism is to say, we dichotomize between, we, dis we, dis we, di we differentiate, we, we keep um, the mind and reason independent from shara'a. That is, human reason independently has access, or by itself independently from shara'a, can determine and can legislate what is good and, and uh, what is good for people. And we may conduct our lives independently from shara' by the use of reason only. That's a bid'ah kulliya. And then you have bid'ah juz'iyya. And then you have bid'ah haqiqiyya and bid'ah idhafiyya. A bid'ah haqiqiyya is a bid'ah for which we do not have support in shara, the Qur'an or the Sunnah, not even in general terms. Do you understand? 
For example, someone wants to bring to be near to Allah Azza wa and brings a bid'ah or brings an action, invents an action that seems to be good, that does not even have support in principle in Shara. Hatta ijmalan la mustanada ilayha. Walaw ijmalan. Even in general terms, we find no support for it in the Quran or in the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. As to al bid'a al idhafiyah which is oftentimes missed by many people as the ulama say rahmahullah ta'ala by many ulama and by many students of ilm because it is not as obvious as al bid'a al haqiqiya which is obviously less serious than al bid'a al haqiqiya but it is nevertheless and nonetheless a bid'a wa anna kulla bid'atin dalala and that is idhafiyah when it has support ijmalan in general terms in sharia but the specifics of it for the specifics of it we find no support for it al-imam al-shatibi for example gives example as an example he gives uh, for example that which was not in the time of rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa nor in the time of his sahaba nor in the time of the early ulama of the madhahib even rahimahumullah ta'ala jami'an that when the Imam finishes Salah, and please forgive me to share this example, and again we mean to learn and to communicate with each other. When the Imam after finishing Salah is required and I underline to raise his hands in dua along with the congregation together, and yad'u wa hum yu'aminun, and he turns to Allah Azza wa in dua, and dua is beautiful, dua is good. A dua huwa al-ibadah, says Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So there is a basis for it, definitely. Very strong general basis for it. But the way it is done, al kayfiyah in this case, of raising the hands after each salah, along with the imam, together and saying ameen, and doing it constantly, that makes it bid'ah. Why? Because it certainly did not happen in the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no doubt about that. It certainly did not happen in the time of Umar, nor Abu Bakr, nor Uthman, nor Ali, nor, nor Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, nor the rest of Allah Ta'ala Anhu. Certainly did not, was not practiced by Abu Hanifa, nor Malik, nor Shafi'i, nor Ahmed, and so on. Wahalumma Jarrah. The question is, yes, it has support in general. Why in general? Because Rasulullah did raise his hands in dua on occasions. Indeed. Rasulullah told us about the importance of dua. We can't do without it. Says he, dua is the ibadah. By the way, the other text that says الْعِبَادَة, the ulama of hadith say that's not an authentic hadith. We have a hadith that is alhamdulillah strong and authentic, which is even stronger than the other one. الدعاء هو العبادة. الدعاء is the ibadah. And so on. Yet, Rasulullah sallallahu who said that hadith, never is reported to have raised his hands in the manner it is done by many people غفر الله لنا ولهم وهدانا وهداهم ورحمنا ورحمهم جميعا to raise your hands after salah in dua in congregation together and make it a habit I underline a habit if sometimes it is done sometimes for a reason that the imam sees for a nazil من النوازل for example a special case or a special event alhamdulillah that's khair but to do it after Salah consistently to the extent that in some masajid, if you don't do it, you have committed a bid'ah. Subhanallah. And people are angry at you. I'm giving an example that is, does not seem to be serious. Yes, it is not serious with respect to many other things because I don't want to give more serious examples at this point. But the fact is Rasulullah says, every bid'ah is a dalala. There is no exception. Every bid'ah is a dalala, there is no exception. So, Al Imam al Shatibi even went to tell us about an, in a case in Al Andalus centuries ago where this alim and abid 
a alim who was known for his uh, for his ibadah and for his zuhd rahmahullah ta'ala in uh, was it i think at that time in uh, was it in cordova cordoba or in which place it was in the masjid the main masjid of which he was the imam and in those days rahmahullah ta'ala uh, the imma were ulama and in that masjid he he said he decided alhamdulillah not to do what is a habit in those days in most masajid where the, the people of ilm and the a'imma lead people in dua after every salah. And he decided not to do that. And amongst those who used to attend salah was a man of authority in the city, a man of nobility and authority and of wealth and of power. And he was attached to his old way. And then he said, go to that shaykh and tell him to lead us in dua after salah. So they went to the shaykh and the shaykh is a alim mujtahid rahimahullah ta'ala. And he says, no, politely. And then again and again, he did this for a few days. And then the alim says, no, and he explained why. And he said, that's the original madhab of the Imam Malik and so on and so forth. All the arguments that were needed were said. And then the man of authority said, tomorrow morning, this man, I will kill with my sword. <laughs> Not doing that led to somebody wanting to kill somebody. This is not a, this is not a fictitious story. This is related by Imam al-Shatibi in Al-I'tasan as a fact that occurred in his time. And that Imam, when his students went to him, they, they feared for him, and they told him, Ya Shaykh, please do something, run, go somewhere. This man is of authority, of kada, and so on. He's decided to kill you with his own sword, to get you killed with his own sword. And that Alim was Alim not only of, of, of the external fiqh, but of the qalb, rahimahullah ta'ala. He said, don't worry, my dear students. Insha'Allah, he will be killed with that sword. And subhanAllah, that was his dua. May Allah kill him with his own sword. And it is said that next morning, subhanAllah, some people indeed, somehow, they got to his own house, they took his sword from him and they killed him with his own sword. I am not saying whether what was done was correct or not correct because the author does not tell us who killed and it was in no way incited by the Imam. Something happened and it is called, it was of the karamat of that Alim rahimahullah ta'ala. Was a karama, was a gift from Allah Azza wa to that Alim Zahid rahimahullah ta'ala. Yes, things can go so much out of hand because when we follow ways other than the pristine picture, imagine in the time of Rasulullah there is this pristine, beautiful painting with no animate object in it huh? because it's an Islamic painting. Imagine this beautiful painting made by this master of painting, the greatest master of painting of all times. And that, and, that, and that painting is in, is in a great uh, museum, let's say. Can you imagine if some modern artist later comes and says, let me put a touch here in this painting, and I'm going to make it look better. What do you think the experts of art will say? They will cry. They will scream. They will probably kill that person. Don't touch it. Don't add anything. What if some painter says, let, no, let me remove something from this. The artists will say, don't touch it. If you touch it, then the value of it, that is, let's say, $200 million. Once you do that, that it's worthless. Subhanallah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa painted this beautiful tableau, this, this, this perfect picture. 
Bid'ah is that sense. Bid'ah is meant well. We mean well by Bid'ah. That is like, I really don't mean anything. I just want to add a, you know, a brush here and a brush there. I'm going to give it more beauty. It cannot be more beautiful than it is. And therefore, even if there is desire in me to do something that was not done then, if there is true mahabba and true love for Allah and for His Rasul, and truly understand that there is nothing that escapes the knowledge of Allah Azzawajal, then even if there is desire in me to do that, I am not going to do that. And then only my action has value. My action is truly action. Otherwise, my action is no action. Ikhlas and ittiba'an. Asalullah al-Ali al-Qadir an yaj'alana min al-mukhlisina lahu min samimi qulubina. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to let us indeed be very, very, very mukhlis, pure of intention from the depth of our hearts, and also that our action is exactly in conformity with the most beautiful picture that is painted by the most beautiful master, صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه وسلم إن قلت صوابا فمن نفس إن قلت صوابا عفوا فمن الله وحده وإن قلت غير ذلك فمن نفسي ومن جهلي ومن الشيطان أعوذ بالله أن أذكر به وأنساه Had I said anything correct, it is from Allah عز وجل alone. Anything incorrect or improper. It is my own ignorance, the weakness of myself, and the impact of shaitan upon me. I seek refuge in Allah that I remind you of him and myself forget him. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The question says, um, uh, the birthday of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is it allowed? He means celebrating, I'm sorry, celebrating the birthday of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Is it allowed or is it something good? Some brothers say we just read the Quran while celebrating it. What is wrong with reading Quran on any occasion at any time? <coughs> what I said a few moments ago as I was uh, trying to communicate to you what bid'ah is and the definition of bid'ah and that uh, bid'ah is always is always within the Muslim ummah again we're talking about within the Muslim ummah that bid'ah which does not lead to kufr there is always an intention of good behind it remember unlike the ma'asiyah there is always an intention of good and there is always justification for it and we said that there are two types of bid'ah for example, in one classification, bid'atun haqiqiyya wa bid'atun idhafiyya. Al bid'atul haqiqiyya is that bid'ah which has no support, no argument to support it in general, ijmalan, min al kitabi aw min al sunnah. Whereas al bid'ah al idhafiyya, the idhafi bid'ah or the relative bid'ah, has support for it in the Qur'an or in the Sunnah, in general terms, but not in the specifics. That's why, of course, reading the Qur'an on any day is good. Performing dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal at any time is good. Being in dua of Allah Azza wa Jal at any time is good. But then to specify a day and to make that day special in terms of the rewards that I'm going to be bestowed on, on that day, that is what makes it a bid'ah in this case. Why? In addition to what I said, and I have not said, again, I have not given too many details, but in addition to what I said, you and I know, and people of ilm know, the students of ilm know, that Allah Azza wa Jal has specified certain days and certain times for certain ibadat. Hasn't he? Indeed. 
And since of the days of the, of, of the week and of the days of the year and of the times of the year that he created, he in his knowledge decided that this day and this day and this hour and that hour, during them we should emphasize ibadah. And he left things, he left other days open. And he did not say, specify this day for ibadah. Now the question comes, why? Since he specified certain days for ibadah, and he left certain days out, he intended to do that, or he forgot to do that? Answer me. He intended to do that. If he forgot to do that, if you say he forgot to do that, that's kufr. So if he intended to leave them open, for what reason? A good reason or not good enough reason? You must answer as a mu'min for a good reason. Then the next question, what reason do I have since the reason for not having specified that day, any day, other than the days that he specified as special, since he had a good reason, will I ever had a reason that is good like that of Allah or better? The answer must be no. Therefore, he intended to leave it open by the very fact that he specified certain days to be special. Number one. Number two, did Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa do that? No. Did the Sahaba do that? No. Did they have the same reason that would motivate me or you later to do that? Did they or not? What is the reason that would motivate you and me, let's say, to celebrate the birthday of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam? What is it? Naam? Ibadah. The love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The reward from Jannah, nearness to Allah Azza wa Jal. Did that reason exist in that time or did it not exist? Did it exist to the same extent as it exists now or even more? Or did it not? The answer is yes, it did exist. In addition to that, Rasulullah said, I was born on Monday when he fasted Mondays and Thursdays, right? And he said, I fast Mondays and Thursdays. And of the reasons, not the only reason, of the reasons he gave is that it's a day during which I was born. Every Monday he fasts, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To thank Allah Azza wa Jal for the gift of life. Did he, however, since the reason exists for celebrating, quote unquote, in the way he did, why did he not appoint his birthday of the 12th of Rabi' al-Awwal every year on that day to fast. Did he have a reason or did he not? Did Allah know or did he not? In addition to that, it is well established. And Imam al-Suyuti, for example, rahimahullah ta'ala in al-Hawi, kitabu al-Hawi, in his kitab al-Hawi, Though Imam al-Suyuti says, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, you may celebrate the birthday of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam under certain conditions. And those conditions are so stringent that the way the birthday of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has been practiced, those conditions are not met. Yet, in accordance to other ulama who disagreed with him before him and after him, that he was wrong, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, even with those conditions. On the basis, basically, of what I just told you, of reasonable uh, reasons in terms of uh, the, uh, the concept of bid'ah and its definitions. He, rahimahullah ta'ala, says himself that the first person who celebrated uh, uh, the birth of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi in the manner it is celebrated by people after that was six, it was first 600 years after the hijrah of Rasulullah sallallahu He was a king, al-Malik al of, of in the area of Palestine at that time, of Sham. He was a good king, apparently, in the, in the judgment of many ulama, 
good king, a man of goodness, and so on. He is the first person who started this practice ever. It was over 600 years later. Definitely, the best way is the way of Rasulullah Yet one is tempted, of course, because you love Allah, you love Rasulullah You're tempted to do that because our nafs is tempted to do like others do and to invent things and to, and, to, and to try new horizons and new things. We like new things. And even you're, you're tempted to be with people who do that and to sit with people who do that. And you're tempted to do that. But that's your test and mine as a mu'min. If this text about ibtida didn't exist, then we would be doing that gladly. But our deen had those texts. Al-Masihiyun, those who claim to have followed Isa alayhi salam later, did not have those texts. They violated those texts if they existed. That's why the deen became what it became even 100 years later, let alone 300 years later, in the time of Constantine, let alone later and much later. You look at the way the deen is practiced by those who say we are Christians, and there is nothing to recognize of the early practice of Isa alayhi salam. Why? Because this door of ibtida' was not closed. And you open it for a small bid'ah and a small bid'ah and the deen becomes unrecognizable centuries later. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم And there is more? Uh, what does it mean? Uh, I think that's what the question is. While people or when people will read the Quran in a, in a, in a place like a new house, like a new house, I see. Oh, I see. And they, and they, they invite people for a ceremony of, uh, of, of, um, of entering in your new house for barakah and so on. Again, alhamdulillah, this is a good niya, isn't it? The person means well. The person means to read Quran. Now, because there is a text, there are texts that teach ibadah is what Allah and His Rasul taught. You open the gate, and that gate will become floodgates. Did people in the time of Rasulullah and later on move to new houses or not? They did. Did they want barakah for their new homes or not? They did. Did they invite ulama and people to sit and read Quran in a circle, each one reading a juz, alhamdulillah, or not? They didn't. And therefore, in accordance to the definition of bid'ah given in an usuli sense, this force, just take the definition that you have learned, take it and study it. It's like a theorem. That's the theorem. And see if any specific case applies to that theorem or not. If the theorem, when applied, when operated on the specific case that you have, applies, then that's a bid'ah. If it is not, then it is not. And your qalb and mine, if it is not filled with hawa, with liking, your, with liking myself, with being impressed with my opinion, with wanting my views to be respected, then I don't mind because what I care for is Allah Azza wa Jal. And from wherever ilm comes to me, and that ilm leads me to what Allah loves and His Rasul Sallallahu loves, I'm going to accept it if there is no hawa. Some of us may have a lot of ilm, but there is hawa. Because the reason for ibtida, as is well established in the Sharia by the ulama, rahmahumullah ta'ala, the reasons for ibtida are mainly, mainly two. And a third one you can add. Lack of ilm, lack of ilm, enough ilm, and or, and the second one, ittiba'u al-hawa. And both of which Allah Azza wa speaks in the Quran as reasons for ibtida'. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ زَيْغٌ That's al-hawa. فَيَتَّبِعُونَ مَا تَشَابَهَ مِنَّا And the key characteristics of a person who follows bid'ah or who 
or who practices ibtida invents things of ibadah like that, uh, the characteristic of that person, if he or she has some ilm, is they don't distinguish between the muhkam and the mutashabih and how to subject the mutashabih to the muhkam and what does this mean and what are examples of this and so on and so forth. Now, and so one stays away from that and one, alhamdulillah, before he enters that new house, there is a dua taught by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma inni as'aluka min khayri hadha al-bayti wa khayri ma huwa lah wa a'udhu bika min sharrihi wa sharri ma huwa lah and so on and you ask Allah Azza wa to give you barakah etc etc but to do it in this way collecting people in this way on this occasion at this specific day that's what I'm afraid will uh, uh, indeed uh, enter it into the fold of the definition of bid'ah Allah ta'ala alam it's already done okay. هل رفع اليدين بالدعاء بعد الصلاة للمنفرد بدعة أم لا؟ Is the raising of the hands is the raising of the hands after salah for an individual person like say so you're performing your salah and you raise your hands in dua after that is it bid'a or not? There is no doubt that Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم on many occasions raised his hands in dua. There is no doubt that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa spoke of raising dua, uh, raising hands, I'm sorry, in dua. The ulama, what they have said, rahimahumullah ta'ala, is that when I spoke about that example, specifically after salah, congregationally, if as an individual you feel there is an urge in you after salah to turn to Allah Azza wa in dua because you feel the moment you feel you need that dua it's not just like a habit I'm going to do it after every salah because it's sunnah because it's not sunnah to do that after every salah but if you feel an urge after salah to turn to Allah Azza wa in dua and the dua after salah is heard is, is one of the best times for, for, for us to perform dua is after salah, dubura kulli salah. Not only after tashahud and before salam, as the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala says and opines that that's what it means, uh, a dua after salah means after you finish tashahud before your salam, that's a view of the Imam Ibn Taymiyyah and others rahimahullah ta'ala and that has support for it, but also there is, uh, there is uh, the other views that lend support that have specific texts and general texts about the permissibility of raising your hands in dua after salah especially when your qalb is present and you feel that need and the moment of after salah is a very special moment uh, as Allah Azza wa subhanahu wa ta'ala characterized it fa insha Allah ta'ala fima a'lam in what I know now that uh, turning to Allah Azza wa in dua by raising your hands after salah as an individual sometimes is not a bid'ah. Uh, the, uh, there is a question about witr salah. Do you raise your hands in? Yes, there is in qunut, in dua ul qunut. Huh? Uh, in your witr salah, when you raise your hands, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa did raise his hands, but the question whether he did raise his hands in witr all the time or sometimes, those are uh, differences amongst the ulama on ijtihadi. It's an ijtihadi matter. And there are those who say you raise your hands in witr during every witr salah. There are those who say if you raise it sometimes, it's okay. There are those who, if you, if you say if you raised it sometimes and you don't raise it at other times, it's okay. Because we do not have explicit texts that Rasulullah raised his hands in dua, in witr, after every witr. And therefore, in the absence of that, of that text, the ulama differed in their ijtihad on this matter. And whichever way you do it, inshallah ta'ala, whether you raise your hands all the time or sometimes, narju min Allah azza wa jalla al-qabool, we hope that Allah azza wa jalla accepts, inshallah. In jama'ah salah during Ramadan in salat al tarawih should one keep his hands and head down and just repeat ameen after the imam? Can you elaborate a bit more on this topic, please? In jama'ah salah, in other words, during Ramadan, in Salat al-Tarawih, should one keep his, hand, his hands and head down 
one mean down like this? This is down, or what is down? Hands down? It says hands and head. Heads, hands and head. If you mean hands down, that is your hands low here. The practice of, uh, of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as sustained and supported by most authentic texts is that his hands are on his chest, sallallahu alayhi wa not too high, not perhaps too low, though some ulama have said that both, uh, uh, both are allowed, namely to put your hand low here on your, on your belly, not, not too low, I pre please, until it ends up on your, on your private organ. So watch that. It's not a good sight to put your hands on your private organ. Uh, if it is done low on the belly or preferably on the chest here, not too high either, but not this way. There is a madhab, yes, a madhab, uh, the Maliki school, whose, uh, whose position in Salah is to, to have the hands uh, mursala, that is, uh, let down like that. But the majority of the ulama and the majority of the opinions and that which is supported by more evidence, Allah Ta'ala Alam, is what I just described. Keeping your head down is of course what we should generally do because that should help us focus, that should help us combat distractions that are physical around us. Instead of looking this way and right and left and, and I'm bombarded by all types of distractions, I shouldn't be doing that. I should keep my head preferably at the spot where I'm going to prostrate myself and try to have my qalb present in that salah and that my salah should not be simply an external exercise and some of us sometimes in salah we are we are you know playing with our beards and scratching and and making sure my 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 shirt is fine and 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 my amama is fine and and all of that and and when I come to Salah, all things come. I start sneezing, I start coughing, I start, start you know, checking my voice. All of those things are distractions. Rasulullah when he saw someone, in accordance to a hadith, when he saw someone you know, scratching his beard, he said to those around him in the, in the meaning of this text, I do not know the level of authenticity of this text. But that text says that Rasulullah said, لو خشع قلب هذا لخشعت جوارحه. If the heart of this individual were still, then his hands, his senses, external senses would be still. Uh, if the organizers would allow me to make minor adjustments or major adjustments. Uh, we have still several questions that came that uh, I'm sure the sisters or the brothers who send them want them answered. And we have still more. The first point of order is because it's 1.10 right now and Dohar is at 1.30, we're going to uh, shift the lunch to after Salat al Dhuhr at 1.45 to 2.30. That way we don't squeeze uh, the lunch time in 15 minutes. And uh, because the second session will be starting at 2.30, that will stay on time, but we will just, instead of doing lunch between now and Salat al Dhuhr at 1.30, we will move it to after Salat al Dhuhr. The second point of order, the question for the prize was, uh, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was reported to have said in the hadith in Musnad Ahmad the thing that I fear most for you is the minor shirk what is this minor shirk called in Arabic now I got three written answers the first one was correct from sister Aisha Ali al -Riya, and she wins that prize and the second one, uh, some sister or brother was trying to translate uh, small from English to Arabic to Sagir, and that's not correct. And the third was correct, but I don't have a name for it. Oh, I have a, I have a name on the back uh, from sister Sumaya Qadri, Ar-Riya. So 
Sister Aisha Ali gets the correct answer and the prize for the first question of the day. Now, as I said, we will be doing uh, lunch after Salat al-Dhuhr. That gives us about 10 more minutes or so to answer the questions that we have. Please don't send any more. And then we'll give you about five minutes to do wudu. We do Salat al-Dhuhr, then lunch, then we continue with the section two of the program at 2.30 as scheduled. Please, uh, these questions that have come, we will answer them. Please don't send any more. What is the ruling about reading Quran collectively, the person on the lines collectively, at the death of close family members and ask for their uh, and ask for forgiveness for them, not for their forgiveness. Relatives and friends visit anyway. This keeps them away from gossips. The person who asked this question, if he or she were here during this discourse and the way uh, the ulama defined bid'ah should be able to answer the question now by him or herself, isn't it? Don't say that Mukhtar said. If you take what Mukhtar said is why Mukhtar said what Mukhtar said. Mukhtar is not an authority. What is an authority is shara. And Mukhtar is only communicating to you shara. And I have any worth at all, as long if I have any worth at all, that worth is consistent or is there as long as I am communicating shara. If I don't communicate shara, I have no authority. I am no one. So learn, learn to take, as alhamdulillah, as, as people who are educated and who have, mashallah, gone to colleges and many of you graduated from colleges and undertook, undertook tasks and challenges of, of learning and, and so on. Subhanallah, use that also to undertake this challenge. And I intended to give you principles rather than detailed answers so that you take that and you never forget that. And just you apply the rules. This is a rule. If you understood it, then apply it. If you have some you know, you know, doubt about how to understand it, that's a different matter. Then you should ask the ulama to clarify that for you, inshallah ta'ala. But again, did people die in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Yes, they died. Was there Quran in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the time of the Sahaba? Yes. Did they want khair for their dead, for their, for their deceased or not? Yes. Do we know that in the time of Rasulullah or in the time of the Sahaba, people collected in the home of someone and read Quran collectively for the sake of the mayyit or not? We don't know that. Yeah, and I used to do that when I was a kid. I used to, when I was young, I used to do that. Because I grew up in, a, in an environment and in a society that did that. And I used to love that. Allah knows. But I knew what I knew. Alhamdulillah, I hope that Allah gave me a little bit of goodness in my qalb. And once I learned otherwise, with sincere pursuit of learning, my qalb cannot do that anymore. It's not just my mind. My qalb cannot do that anymore. Subhanallah, Imam al-Junaid, for those who, <coughs> who know Imam al-Junaid, rahimahullah ta'ala, had said, and al-Junaid is hujja ala ghayrih. Those who say we follow their path, well, al-Junaid rahimahullah ta'ala said what he said. So if someone else later who claims to follow the path of al-Junaid rahimahullah ta'ala and does not adhere by the minhaj of al-Junaid, then no matter what he or she does, you're wrong. They gave the minhaj and we judge in accordance to the minhaj that they gave. They gave in other words, a methodology. They gave principles that say, these are our principles. How do we judge later whether people adhere to their principles or not? Even if they claim that Al-Junaid did this or did that, 
by the principles that he said, these are my principles I live by. And he said, rahimahullah ta'ala, sometimes there is, a, there is a nukta in my qalb, min al qawm, min ahwal al qawm. There is something that, that there is, a, uh, there is something that tickles my heart of the things that the people do, the people meaning the people in his circles, the ulama and the ubad and the worshippers and the doctors of qulub do. And he says, I love to do it, I'm tempted to do it. And I do not go ahead and do it until and unless I find support in it in the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam. So that reason existed, yet they didn't do that. So I should suffice myself aktafi bimaktafa bihi al-awwalun min ghayri taghirin wa la tabdeel. Subhanallah, ma kana kafiyan li rasulihi wa li abi bakrin wa li umar. Subhanallah, ala yakunu kafiyan li. What was enough for a rasulullah, what was deen for rasulullah and for his companions, should it not be deen for me? Al-Imam Malik goes to the extent, rahimahullah ta'ala, to say anyone who assumes or who alleges that there is something that came after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is good and that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not do it, then this person, Za'ama, this person has alleged that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam betrayed his mission. To this extent, he went, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So I should stay away from that, even though my qalb is led to that. The more ilm I have, the more ilm I have, the more illuminated my qalb is, wallah al azim and the clearer this becomes, and the easier this becomes, and the sweeter this becomes. If I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, let me love him every day, not once a year. If I love the Qur'an, let me not love the Qur'an when a person dies. But when I live every day, and I love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam every day, and I keep him in my heart and in my mind every day, I celebrate Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's birth and mission every day. And if I do that, Wallahi al azim you will see how much I will realize, Wallahu ta'ala alam, that this is not, this is not, needed this is not necessary this is not good Allahu alam <coughs> again all the questions you can answer them remember this is not just a question and answer session uh, without having given you the the principles and the theorems and the basis for these judgments you have become in a sense you have been imparted upon Ilm that I shared with you from that which was imparted upon me. Ilm that if you take it and absorb it, you have become, subhanallah, endowed with a lot of ilm pertaining to this issue. I gave you the definition. All these questions, please highlight on the congregational dua in Ramadan after finishing Quran in Taraweeh. All of that, find out, do research. If you don't know whether Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa practiced something or not and his sahaba, then the next thing is you do what? Go research. Did he or did he not? Because you may, if you said he didn't and he did, that's a mistake. Don't jump quickly to say he didn't or they didn't. Don't jump quickly. And also you have to know the reasons that led to this new thing. Did they exist then or did they not exist then? This requires some fiqh and some usul. But some of them do not require that much. They require the, the direct application of that principle or that theorem that I told you uh, that the ulama gave, rahimahumullah ta'ala, about the definition of al-bid'ah. Uh, in in view, uh, the view of ishraq versus ikhlas, sometimes out of fear of not having pure ikhlas, a person becomes immobilized and they do nothing 
For example, you fast on a Thursday to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the day goes on, you begin to get hungry. So you tell yourself you want to get close to Allah azza wa jal, and that you also need to lose weight. So it's best if you continue. Does this mean is it, it is in vain? And so if you should break your fast because you're not getting any blessing for the fast. So should you, probably the question, just break your fast because you're not getting any blessing for the fast. How can one achieve blessings and pure ikhlas? The last question is, 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 uh, requires, requires a, a camp of tazkiyah to nafs of many days. And we, we, we are been organizing now for the second year a camp of tazkiyah to nafs in the mountains of the Adirondacks in New York State for 10 days. Uh, from June the 13th till the 23rd, and this is the second year we're doing that, and um, it's already overbooked. And it, it, we're taking 10 days to begin to touch on how we, we cleanse our qulub and how we attain tazkiyah, insha'Allah ta'ala. But that's a process, my dear sister and brother, that's a process. Again, ikhlas is a state of the qalb. Remember what we said yesterday? If the sister or the brother uh, 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 were here yesterday or last night, then you heard, you've heard that in principle, if I give you uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the blueprint, if you will, the general blueprint or outline, what to do to cleanse one's qalb. Those who were here yesterday. They should have that as a question <laughs> to be answered. <laughs> That's more specific, yes. And in more general terms, what did we say? That the general, no? No, that's specifics. We don't have time for that because we're just going to be quickly answering this question. Diet and exercise. If the sister or the brother were here today, is diet and exercise. Some of you who were not here yesterday, they said, what is he talking about? <laughs> this man is crazy. And the diet we spoke about is the diet of ilm. And we compare that to the diet of nourishment of the physical body when we want an external beautiful image. And that is ilm and the beneficial ilm and there is also fatty ilm and so on. So a good diet of ilm. And number two, we said exercise. And exercise is mujahadatu nafs. Mujahadatu and nafs to go against the nafs. And there are details after that. But the question is, is this sister or this brother who is fasting, let's say begins to fast Monday or Thursday for Allah Azza wa and sometimes in the way uh, when he or she starts says, oh, you know, this is great, I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to keep on because I'm going to lose weight. Is this ikhlas? No, it is not ikhlas. Of course, in the way we have defined ikhlas also earlier, this is, I know the word ishraq is very heavy, but that's what Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called these things to warn us against them. He called riya a shirk al asghar yet he called it shirk, minor, but it is called shirk. So that's a contaminant. The fact that I say to myself, and I, I, there is a burst inside of me that says it's good, you're going to lose weight. I should watch my nafs. I should train myself so that I don't get to that point. And if that comes to my qalb and it tickles me, I should deny it. Just like sometimes I must be, I, not sometimes, I always must be conscious of my physical acts. I must get to the level, a more advanced level, to be conscious of the acts of my qalb. When my qalb moves from one state to the another, I must detect it. And I must respond immediately. So if this sister or this brother responds immediately about denying that, no, no, that's not what I'm going to do. That's not, I'm not going to allow that burst to contaminate my original burst. Alhamdulillah, if I do that and then I ignore it if it is from shaitan, if I don't feel it's me, if I feel something it's external of me, I don't want that, but it comes to my head, then I just ignore it. And there are reasons for that. I just ignore it. But if it is within me, and I initiate it within my nafs, then I should fight it, I should deny it. And I continue my fast, inshallah ta'ala, and I work so that next time I do better.
we do some things with ikhlas and we see that those actions produced good results and you feel happy about it and you like to do those actions more often sometimes you have discomforts in not producing the desired results sometimes you have a discomfort in not producing the desired results and you are reluctant to do these actions again does this constitute a partial uh, shirk and that means if I understood the question is when sometimes it doesn't produce the desired results and then you feel a discomfort inside your qalb is this a part of this minor shirk and this hidden shirk if I understood the questioner properly inshallah ta'ala arju that no this is not uh, a type of, of shirk khafi or shirk uh, that is asghar why because if the discomfort is generated by the notion that you desired your uh, the desire you desired Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be pleased with you because what motivates your action is the pleasure of Allah Azza wa is that burst of fear or longing or love for Allah Azza wa and for what Allah has and the results are what meaning the results have not been the pleasure of Allah Azza wa have not done enough to please Allah Azza wa if that's what you mean that's good because my nafs and yours should never be assessed highly you should always always doubt the nafs you should always enter to Allah's Azza wa Jalla door from the door of bankruptcy of iflas rather than thinking I have something you should always think I have done nothing and you mean it and it's not enough because Allah Azza wa Jalla is is too beautiful to do enough for him subhanahu wa ta'ala or if the discomfort is that you didn't see external results in the community or in your family or in your friend or in the path of da'wah then that should not if it is discomfort in the sense you have concern you wished it were it were otherwise you wished people alhamdulillah obey allah azza wa jalla more you wish the community were stronger you wished we loved all of us allah azza wa jalla more and obeyed him more and we're all on the stream on the same path and our hearts were together for example if this is what you call discomfort then that's fine and good alhamdulillah Allah Azza wa says in the Quran for example about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam um, فلعلك ولع, فلعلك so Rasulullah used to feel that concern, that, that, that concern inside of his heart, not depression, not anxiety, no. <laughs> Rasulullah is never depressed, is never anxious. A mu'min, the more iman, the less, action, the less anxiety, the less depression. There is no doubt about it. When our iman and especially if Tawheed al-Rububiyyah is weaker, yes, we get agitated and depressed and anxious and so on. So if your concern is that people have not يعني, responded the way they should have and they have the ability, then that's a concern, that's fine. But alhamdulillah, keep in mind of, in mind, Tawheed al-Rububiyyah. Keep in mind that results do not depend on you directly. You are a tool and results depend on Allah Azza wa Jal and that's part of Tawheed al-Rububiyyah ma sha Allah kana wa ma lam yasha lam yakun whatever Allah wills will be whatever Allah does not will will not be and that gives you peace of mind maybe concern but not anxiety and not depression so you're okay that's not shirk neither asghar nor akbar Allah ta'ala alam if I had a dream of hearing Quran recited twice once Jibreel alayhi salam reciting in the other surah Mursalat surah al-Mursalat the whole surah beautifully what does this message tell me jazakallahu khairan if you heard the quran recited in your dream mashallah ta'ala that's always a good thing it's always usually a good sign and may allah azza wa jalla increase you in your iman and may allah azza wa jalla increase you in your ilm and all of us with you inshallah ta'ala wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh